Uh, Ezra, uh, he's here. I saw him a minute ago. I haven't seen him yet, but... Uh, I'm not sure that he's missing, I just don't know where exactly he is. Excluding uh, me, Not on. You think they're gonna? T am I on? But it doesn't sound very good. I mean, I'm talking. Really? Really? Yeah. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Let's get the show on the road. So as I mentioned uh, 30 minutes ago or so, my name is Paul, uh, and uh, I have been asked to moderate this morning's session on district cooling, a solution for a feverish planet. Um, 
I have two small children at home, and they are just starting to reach the age where they're asking what daddy does when he's away and when he's not at home, and he's supposed to be out working. And uh, they're four and six, so it's, there are limits on how much detail I can provide them with. But lately, we've been starting to talk to them about the environment and the importance of protecting our common home here on Earth. And I have started to use this concept of a feverish planet to describe what I consider to be a, a very serious emergency for, for the planet and by extension for our species. And when I explained to my six-year-old that our planet Earth has a fever, of course his natural inclination is to suggest that we give the Earth some medicine. And in a sense, that's more or less what we're here to talk about this morning. How, by what means and in what form can we medicate the earth? Can we make the earth better? And how in the process can we achieve the other things that we need to achieve as a civilization, development, growth, security? So if the earth needs medicine, uh, those of you here in the room today and in particular, uh, the distinguished group that we'll have on the panel this morning are going to have to be the doctors. So what I would like to do is um, bring our panelists up onto the stage now, uh, and uh, I'd invite you all to, to come and have a seat, and uh, we can get started with what I hope is going to be a, a very fruitful exchange of ideas. One thing. Uh, I've already done one speech this morning. I'm not going to do another one up here now. So I expect support from the audience. That is to say, I want questions. You see, I don't have a chair. I'm already working hard by standing up. I'm going to be walking around. I'd like someone else to do the talking. I'm already getting tired of my own voice. So please do ask questions. Challenge the speakers. It's the only way we're going to have a, a meaningful and useful debate. So if I could ask all of the panelists to join me up here on stage now. And uh, I will introduce everyone once they're, once they're up. So, yeah, you're... Uh, yeah, well, actually... Everybody comfortable? Uh, I think mics will come. Uh, there's one down there. Yeah. Uh, and we'll have microphones for our... There. Everyone is mic'd up? There is one. Thank you. Okay, so it's my honor to introduce this distinguished group uh, moving from, well, my left to right. Uh, first, Her Excellency, <laughs> let me get the name correct, Eva Polono, Ambassador of Sweden. Thank you very much for being here. Um, Ambassador Polono has been working and leading a glittering career in diplomacy for, for nearly 30 years now. Uh, looking after the interests of Sweden, but also, I think, fighting for a more fair and prosperous world. Thank you very much for joining us. Per Dalin. Uh, per is an old friend. It's difficult to introduce your friends. Mm. President of DEVCO, uh, a man who's probably forgotten more about district cooling than, than, than I'll ever know. Someone I look to for advice and, and support, uh, and someone who sits on the board of my organization. Per, thanks for being here. Siria Martinez from the UN Environment Program. Uh, importantly, a person who is very much engaged now in the political work that needs to be done 
in driving the district energy agenda forward, but also someone with a very robust technical background who understands the detail of how these things function. And I think the combination of the two is extremely, extremely valuable. Isram El Sarag, Director, Research and Development at the Gulf Organization for Research and Development. Uh, a person with 25 years of experience in consultancy, engineering, energy, <coughs> buildings, and the intersection uh, between these things, and a great deal of, of expertise, which I, I know will make an important contribution <coughs> to the panel this morning. John Dulac from the International Energy Agency. Um, John is a, another person who has a very deep technical understanding of the issues we're facing, a background in engineering and urban planning, and at the same time, a detailed knowledge of the policy framework that needs to be put in place to allow these things to develop as we would like them to. And finally, Vinod. <coughs> I don't like to make mistakes with people's names. Kesavaner. Uh, I spoke to Vinod last night and asked how he would like to be introduced because I don't like to just read out people's boring CVs in a boring way. And he said, just tell them I work for Mount Effect. Uh, I think there's a bit more to it than that. Uh, this is a person with a, a great deal of experience in the field of engineering and energy uh, and someone I'm very pleased to have with us this morning. Now, what I'd like to do uh, to get us started is ask each of our panelists to uh, make a short statement. But before we're going to do that, we had one panelist who was unfortunately unable to make it here this morning. Um, so if we could, uh, I'd like to have him briefly with us by video. If we could play the video, please. Good day, ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests. Uh, first of all, profound apologies of uh, not being there uh, in person due to other <coughs> pressing uh, um, interactions. Uh, but today we would be uh, talking about uh, the resource efficiency under the Montreal Protocol, uh, and especially uh, the potential offered by uh, district energy systems, uh, including district cooling and district heating. Briefly, uh, the Montreal Protocol, uh, with which I have been working since 1987, is considered to be one of the world's foremost multilateral uh, environment agreement with 197 <coughs> countries have ratified it four times. Uh, and in this respect, uh, the latest agreement which we arrived at was in Kigali last year, uh, in 2016, around this time of the year, we were, where we were able to uh, agree on a ratification to address uh, the phase down of HFCs, one of uh, a group of very powerful greenhouse gases. And among the uh, agreements was also uh, the effect to address energy efficiency. And that is where uh, we would like to uh, share with you our visions and what we are expecting. Just the phase down of HSC by about 85% to 2050, we are uh, awaiting uh, reduction and, uh, and avoidance of half a degree of uh, uh, climate change. And if we are able to uh, capture energy efficiency in an appropriate manner, we would also be able to address up to another half a degree. So a, a potential which we may be able to address up to one degree under the Montreal Protocol, where the central district energy systems like district cooling and heating can play a significant role. In Sweden, for example, we have about 25% penetration of the market, and we expect the same amount of penetration globally. Having said that, we are also be, will be addressing how to deal with energy efficiency. Although under the Montreal Protocol, we have not done so earlier uh, under the phase down of uh, ozone depleting substances, but that's the mandate that has been provided to by the, uh, by the parties to the Montreal Protocol. And we hope to be able to uh, devise the criteria under the executive committee on how to maintain and or enhance energy efficiency while also recognizing the key role played by other institutions like the GCF, uh, the Global Climate Fund, the uh, Global Environmental Facility, and to see how do we seek, 
harmonization. So in conclusion, uh, I wish you all success in the uh, current uh, meeting. And uh, we do think uh, now that we have uh, legislation in place. We also have an opportunity of cost-effective uh, ozone climate synergy and to avoid a degree of uh, climate change. So we look forward to our continued interaction with the global community in order to achieve this low-lying fruit. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, now, in order to get us started, Your Excellency Ambassador Polano, a short statement from you, please. Is this better? Uh, I, uh, I'm very glad to see you all here and uh, dear panelists. I am the ambassador of Sweden and I have been working here in Qatar during the last three years, continuously impressed by everything that's uh, developing day by day in Qatar, just like you mentioned, Paul, in the initial remarks of your first speech. Uh, and uh, I would like to congratulate Qatar for all uh, that you are doing, hosting so many international meetings and conferences. And again, we are here for the first time outside of Europe that the Euroheat Power Association that you are hosting us here in uh, Doha. And this means very much to all of us from Europe. And I think I am invited here to speak about EU, European Union, uh, but also Sweden. Sweden is a member of European Union since 1995 and we are uh, in Sweden, uh, and I think that's what I would like to focus on uh, in my first remarks here, that uh, we are invited to be a good example to the world and to share our policy and legislation and our technology uh, with, uh, with the world in line with our Paris Agreement on global warming and, of course, Montreal Protocol and the Kigali Amendments. And um, I, I see also that uh, Qatar has reached very far uh, by having the biggest, uh, since the focus is district cooling, the biggest district cooling installation here in Doha in the world. Actually, Stockholm has uh, the second biggest in the world. But now I learn also by focusing more and more on this very relevant topic for uh, global warming and climate change, that Qatar will have the first, uh, the biggest uh, capital cooling installation here around 2020 or 2021 uh, in Lusail. And uh, that is, of course, highly important. So in a way, I would like to focus on that Qatar and Sweden are very progressive countries and can be uh, seen as having very close partnership already, but we can continue on these lines. Um, I'm, I'm proud to be here today, and I think uh, Sweden has uh, been highly recognized for what we have done to the world on the uh, environmental issues and uh, what all led up to Paris and, and to Kigali and uh, everything else. It actually started in Stockholm because Sweden was hosting the first United Nations Conference on the Environment in 1972. And, uh, this was, of course, a trigger for us in Sweden, but also to the world. Uh, Sweden had a very progressive uh, possibility to develop quickly. We were neutral in the World War, and uh, uh, after the 50s and 60s, we could uh, focus a lot on how to be uh, a society where equality, democracy, and environmental issues uh, took a lead. And uh, therefore, we have also seen that our legislation, our policies, and our technology is uh, leading in the world, together with other European countries, of course. Uh, we was actually uh, in this uh, spring 2017 uh, selected by the World Economic Forum to be the number one country in the world meeting the Sustainable Development Goals Index. We are best provided to meet that, and we are very proud to have that. We are top-ranked also in many other indexes, but I think in the 
uh, in the sustainability, we have a lot to offer. Um, we set ambitious goals always. That's the way uh, how we can proceed and, and continue with uh, this positive development. Our prime minister said actually last year that we would like to be a fossil free um, country in 2040. And uh, we have been uh, focusing on this a lot with uh, our um, uh, focus on sustainability in many ways. Um, the energy mix in Sweden uh, back in the oil crisis days of the early 70s uh, was that we used 70% uh, uh, in, in the early 70s uh, oil as our energy source. Today it is 20%. And uh, we have also seen uh, in the climate change negotiations, as everybody know, that um, it has been difficult to get the emerging strong uh, countries and markets to, uh, to say that they are willing to give up carbon emissions because they need economic growth and they need to catch up quickly. But Sweden and our development has actually proven that we can be uh, um, growing uh, in a country, having economic growth and at the same time reduce carbon emissions. Uh, and this is a very important factor. And, and how to do this? Well, district cooling is a very important uh, part in how to reduce carbon emissions. And Sweden, uh, as you know, is contrary to Qatar, a very cold country. But actually, this uh, technology that we are focusing on here with district cooling and district heating, it started with district heating in Sweden. And we had our first district heating uh, installation already back in 1948 in the city of Karlstad. And uh, the first district cooling uh, we started in the early 90s, and now in Sweden we have 34 cities who have very ad advanced district cooling um, installations all over Sweden. And uh, when it comes to cooling in Sweden, 25% of the cooling is done through capital cooling, which makes Sweden the number one in the world using capital cooling. And since we all know that this reduces carbon emissions by 40, 50 percent, uh, this is a substantial way of uh, fulfilling our commitments uh, in the whole world to the Paris Agreement. Uh, the 25 percent that I mentioned we have in Sweden could be compared to uh, Europe, which has an average one to two percent. But here again, I would like to single out Qatar, because Qatar, uh, according to what I have learned now, uh, between 5 to 10 percent of your cooling is uh, done through district cooling. So you are really also a very advanced country in this. And we are, we are actually very glad to have uh, had business developers and, and uh, very creative engineers uh, being here since more than 10 years from the Swedish company Devco, I'm glad to have to my next here, uh, Mr. Per Dahlin, who is president of Devco, who has worked hand in hand uh, with uh, Marafek and the uh, Qatari authorities here in order to, uh, to develop the uh, district cooling in Qatar. Sweden has also uh, been famous for the renewable energy uh, transfer, and I, I already talked about the fossil free society that we would like to have, but we have uh, a good combination of hydropower and nuclear power, and then a bit more than 10% are biofuels and, and uh, uh, a little bit less than 10% are, are created by wind energy. But uh, since District cooling is all about energy efficiency and how to use the energy surplus uh, and how not to waste any energy. It is, of course, super uh, important also to see how we can have a comprehensive urban planning in order to use everything in the green, sustainable way. And uh, I was very glad to invite again and reconfirm our invitation to the president, Isal Kovari, uh, of Karama to come to Sweden together with uh, a delegation to see uh, the very vital parts of Stockholm or many other cities that also can be used as very good examples. How we have uh, in a successful way been done comprehensive urban planning with waste management, water management, green construction and district cooling. 
Uh, I think 80% in Stockholm is done uh, through district cooling. Um, so um, I see that um, everybody is uh, looking like perhaps I'm speaking too much about my beloved country. Uh, but I'm very proud both of uh, what we have achieved and what we can achieve together with the world, but especially here, that's my job, with Qatar. And I think the, the conclusive remarks from my side is that we are here to share our technology, our, uh, our legislation, our policy, our know-how that we have developed during the last century, together with uh, many of you here uh, in uh, representing the whole world, and especially with Qatar. And I thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to be here this morning, and uh, I look forward to listen to the other panelists. Thank you very much, Paul. Your, Your Excellency, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for, 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 these, for these thoughtful remarks. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, your excellencies can take as much time as they like. Per, you get one minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perdarin, tell thank us, you, thank are you. we the I solution to a feverish planet? Yeah, thank you, Eva and Paul, distinguished guests and uh, participants, and especially all Qatari friends. Uh, it's been 10 years since coming here first, with, with all sand desert. And, uh, what we see now is something very impressive. Uh, what I want to emphasize on is that, well, Eva took, uh, brought in a lot of the perspective, uh, but if we look at from, uh, from the perspective also that was mentioned in the, in the video, that uh, the uh, Kigali Amendment will mean a lot to the global warming impact. And I started in 2015, came to the first Montreal Protocol meeting and introduced uh, district cooling as the not-in-kind solution, as it's called in UN. Uh, and um, since then, it has been a rapid uh, way forward uh, into the Kigali Amendment. Uh, but the most uh, important part there is that we see that district cooling can take about 25% of this market to the, the uh, well solve uh, both the energy efficiency part and also the uh, the phase down of refrigerants. So, therefore, district cooling has an extremely important role on the on the global uh, warming arena. So, what I want to say is is that also from from the new uh, perspective, what I want to underline is that it's very very important to have a long term stable policy framework, because district cooling is a long-term investment and stability to it, so that these uh, huge investments can pay off at the end. So that is, is also from my side, uh, uh, very glad to see that also we have had, we got the first uh, uh, member also into Euroheat and Power, Marafek. Uh, to take part in, in, well, have an insight in how we work with the policy issues in, in, uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, you're the first one, probably will be more, but that is a big step forward and I uh, hope that we can support and exchange in the future so that we can help you in, in, in the policy work as well. Thanks a lot, Per. Celia Martinez. Uh, it was a few years ago now that I got a phone call from the United Nations saying that they were going to be doing a lot of work on, on district energy, and I was delighted, <laughs> pleasantly surprised. Uh, tell us, why, why, why has UNEP decided to get involved? Uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank you all for inviting uh, United Nations Environment to be here, and thank you especially uh, to the Qatar authorities for the very uh, warm welcome that we've had here. Um, as uh, you've mentioned the, uh, the Paris Agreement, we've heard the Montreal Protocol. Um, you all know that, uh, we were asking why are we, are we working on this, uh, you know that the um, energy demand, the energy consumption of buildings, global energy consumption of buildings is uh, dedicated mostly uh, to address the, the demand on space heating, on cooling and on hot water. And we know that this demand is mostly met by fossil fuels. 
So if we want to meet all these goals established by the uh, Paris Agreement, we know that we would have to cut around 75% uh, the emissions that we are currently uh, meeting by 2050. We want to meet that. On the other hand, we have uh, many countries that are evolving, people are demanding for more comfort. So we know that the demand for cooling, for uh, space heating, uh, for hot water is going to increase. Uh, we know that there are some figures from the International Energy Agency showing that uh, in 2050, uh, cooling, demand for cooling could grow in Asia or certain regions in Latin America about 600%, which is huge. What does it mean? Uh, for us, that means that any climate transition, any energy transition uh, necessarily needs to address urban heating and cooling. This is a must, this needs to be done. And the uh, United Nations environment uh, has realized this is a fact. And uh, for this reason, we are working on this. We launched uh, the District Energy in Cities Initiative two years ago. And this initiative is part of the Sustainable Energy for All platform. Uh, and it's one of the implementing mechanisms of the energy efficiency accelerator of the Sustainable Energy for All platform. We uh, started the initiative with uh, su support, funding support from uh, Denmark. Uh, we now have uh, funding support from the Global Environmental Facility, and we also have support, funding support from the ministry, Italian Ministry of Environment. Uh, what do we do is um, help uh, emerging economies and developing countries, because the United Nations works uh, mostly in developing countries, to uh, create, develop a framework that enables uh, the development of district energy. So we try to open doors uh, for all that work in the private sector uh, to help increase the uptake of district energy, district cooling and district heating in, uh, in regions where it doesn't exist uh, yet. We are working in Latin America, in Asia, uh, in, uh, in Northern Africa, in Eastern Europe, um, to help that. For us, just to, just to finish, it's very important to be here. Um, we think that uh, political leaders, and every one of us is not just political leaders, uh, that have the power to do something, need to show to the rest of the countries that some this something can be done. Uh, so we um, really appreciate the efforts of, uh, of Qatar in uh, supporting district cooling. And, uh, and yeah, one of the methodologies actually from the Digital Energy Initiative is get the best from around the world and try to transfer this knowledge uh, to what we call the learning countries or learning, learning cities. Um, we then hope that with the help of everyone, uh, we, can, we can contribute to stop from our side uh, climate change. Thank you. Thanks, Cecilia, and thanks for being here. <laughs> Isra, you have a vast experience right across the spectrum of, of heating, cooling, ventilation, energy efficiency, buildings. Uh, in your 25 years of research work, um, what have you come to learn and think about district heating and cooling and how they fit into solving the problems that we're discussing? Okay, uh, thank you very much. I um, um, guess I want to start to, to talk about our beloved country, Qatar. So, uh, and yes, I have to take this opportunity to talk about what happened actually in Qatar in the last decade. It's very, this is a very important step to build some concepts and benchmarking on what we are going to do in the future as well in this session to get really benefit of this panel discussion. I'm going to just put this type of benchmarks so people, they can understand and um, structure um, uh, the, the discussions in the next uh, panels as well. So what we happened, 2007, we worked on the development. Actually, I'm coming from GORD, Gulf Organization for Research and Development. We are under the umbrella of Qatar DR. And as you know, Qatar DR is an one of the biggest investment arms, not only in Qatar, but in real estate all over the world. So this is why also we can say we are nephews or sisters to Marafik in a way or another. So uh, we developed the sustainable systems, the, uh, the uh, Qatar Sustainability Assessment System in 2007-2009, and launched and actually deployed 
initially by Lucel City. I was in uh, Europe, and just to give you something, Paul, I was uh, presenting in Europe what we have done in sustainability. This is, by the way, and they are talking in Europe about five uh, sustainable cities, Copenhagen, they're talking about also uh, Stockholm. I thought, what about Lucel? And because you have another city, we city number six in sustainability, but nobody actually in Europe knows about it. But actually, we expanded this message. I'm going to talk about it right now. So we they, they initially actually adopted these sustainability standards. Uh, the sustainability standards talk about sustainability from the macro level, from the urban planning, which is very important for district cooling. We're not talking about district cooling as a technology. Without urban proper urban planning, this technology will not work. And this is why we work from the macro level, from urban planning to site work to energy, water, building, materials, uh, environmental uh, quality, and management and operation. So we have a full scheme developed for Qatar. And before, people, they think always here in the Arab world, what we do, we import sustainability. But actually, we exported sustainability to the world. And now GSAS approved officially by the FIFA for the 2022 venues. Why? To, in lay of all other events. Deployed by mega developers, Lucel, Monatic, this is what we call them. This is why the GSAS districts and infrastructure become the first in the, we can talk about in terms of sustainability, compared to the international systems, the biggest in terms of master planning. And this is very important. Also, we have developed new schemes, which completely unique even to the world. They don't have, for example, railways. I traveled all Europe to talk about railway sustainability. And actually, we implemented railways, GSAS for railways, which is unique. GSAS is sports. The investment happened actually from Qatar Olympic Committee, which is also take another step for the FIFA tournament. You see, this is also a big plan. In energy level, this is which is very important, we don't want, in the whole sustainability, it's very important to understand. We have different local authorities. We have ministries. We have Kahrama. We have Gord. So we need to ensure that these sustainability elements will never conflict with the local authorities' laws. That means there should be a harmony with Kahrama regulations. You should have harmony with municipality regulations. You should harmony with the Minister of Environment regulations. And this is why it become unique. So for an energy perspective, to come out of all of this picture, and this has developed to be the first in the MENA region as performance-based standards, not a prescriptive method. For example, for buildings and also district cooling, what we have, we develop benchmarks for buildings. With these benchmarks, you can now offset. Actually, these benchmarks were, were done or were developed very, very, very carefully to ensure that you implement the best strategies and maybe you adopt the best strategies for the local without conflicting. So we are not prescriptive way so to conflict with the municipalities or local authorities. So on that regard, if you don't want to use district cooling, that means you have to meet the benchmark, you have to offset by, by something else. And this is why we built energy hierarchy. With this energy hierarchy from the passive design benchmark, if you don't meet the passive design benchmark, and then the energy delivery benchmark, and the, C and the emissions benchmark. With this type of benchmark, actually we make it very stringent, and maybe in Lucille City, they will, people technically, they will talk, uh, talk about it. Uh, this is maybe uh, part of it for district cooling and systems to also, because as you know, local regulations, they talk about, uh, for example, uh, labeling, efficiency of systems, and so on. To come out of, out of this without conflicting with the local authorities, we develop something that's called the seasonal energy efficiency ratio tools. This is part of the mandatory requirement for all the sustainability requirements. Because now, GSAS is part of the building code, because part of the green construction. So it can become like a code. So we develop the seasonal energy efficiency ratio, uh, because we're not talking now about a system efficiency. I'm not talking about what you do in your peak. I'm talking about how your system will perform seasonally, and we develop a special tool for this. And now, all the FIFA 2022, the railways, Lucille City, actually, Marafik, they come to our tool and they complied with our standards uh, they, we, we, with the higher standards. Actually, we, we issue them a certificate for the uh, performance based on the seasonal energy efficiency. And actually, this is a very, very long technical process and discussions. I know I can talk too much. I don't want to give the, uh, the, the uh, but I have to talk about my beloved country. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Isam. I, I knew we'd get expertise. I wasn't expecting such passion. That's a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks uh, very much. And, and I think an important lesson there, you know, we often, 
as, as Europeans, we might come to a place like this, and of course our idea is to share what we have learned and share what we do back home, but it, it's important to underline that we're also learning all the time, and all of us are hugely impressed by the, the scale and the quality of what's being done here. Good. Uh, John, do you like? Uh, John from the International Energy Agency, who, as I say, has all sorts of expertise around energy and urban planning. Um, John, how does the IEA see all of this? Uh, okay, good. I just wanted to check I was on. Um, you know, I've been thinking, Paul, uh, this question about what is the f a feverish planet and the solutions around it, and I, um, it comes down to really three things that relate to the discussion that I think we'll have over the next two days. The first, uh, of course, that has been mentioned several times is that uh, we have a commitment to move towards two degrees or below over the next 40 years. Um, and that this is really, um, we're talking about feverish planet is becoming a major challenge. I was in China 10 days ago, um, and the Chinese government was presenting what they see happening in terms of temperature changes across China um, in a two degree world, which is what we consider sustainable. Um, and already, at a two degrees temperature rise, the number of cooling degree days in some Chinese cities will more than double. Um, and that's just to give you a sense of what is happening. We see in countries that historically we never would have considered as being hot, um, for example, Sweden, that are actually growing cooling demand quite significantly. Um, and this is the kind of feverish planet we're talking about, uh, which poses a lot of challenges, of course, moving forward. The second, in terms of feverish planet, and coming back to Yun Environment's point about what's happening in terms of demand, um, cooling is growing extremely rapidly. Uh, heating, perhaps, still remains uh, for much of the northern hemisphere a major challenge, but um, in rapidly emerging economies, we're seeing cooling growth rates in terms of energy demand as much as 10 to 15 percent per year. Um, we sold an air conditioner, uh, four air conditioners, in fact, every second last year. So cooling growth is happening at an extremely rapid pace, and this is not going to stop. Um, we look out to 2060 in our energy technology perspectives at the IEA, and just to give you a sense of how feverish this is, over the next 40 years, we will build 10,000 square meters every single minute. That is the size of Paris every five days. Okay, so growth in terms of the built environment is happening at an incredibly feverish pace, and we have to find solutions for this that are efficient, affordable, that address comfort, as Paul mentioned earlier, um, and that certainly meet our long-term ambitions for a sustainable world. Um, I think the last point on feverish, and how does this tie back into district energy, um, we took 100 years to essentially very slowly develop technologies. And if we want to meet our goals by 2050 and beyond, that means we essentially have to double the pace of innovation. We have to double the pace of how quickly we deploy efficient and sustainable solutions. And district cooling and heating, of course, are a big portion of this when looking at what we can do, what we know we can do using affordable solutions. And I think particularly what's perhaps most interesting, and we'll see a little bit of this in the presentations this afternoon from the different examples coming across from the globe, is that district energy, in fact, is a very flexible tool. It's one of the reasons that we like district energy as a clean and sustainable solution. It can take into account high efficiencies using things like very efficient cooling equipment, for example. It can take into account variable renewables and use those within the district energy network to have a more flexible energy system. And I think most importantly, coming back to your po point, Paul, is that it can also at the same time address comfort. It is unrealistic for us to think that the world is going to continue to live in an environment where people are not comfortable. If already China is talking about doubling cooling degree days in some cities, if we're seeing air conditioners, four air conditioners sold every single second, this is a clear message that in fact people want more comfort. And we have to find efficient solutions, sustainable solutions to address that demand. Thanks, John. I'm just wondering if we should be opening up an air conditioning business. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, uh, those are a lot of numbers to think about. Wow. Okay. Uh, Vinod. So Vinod's a mechanical engineer, uh, which means I imagine he gets his hands dirty uh, on a regular basis, making all this stuff work in practice. Be keen to know what you think. Yeah. Uh, good morning, uh, Her Excellency Ambassador of Sudan, uh, distinguished uh, guests and uh, my friends. Yes, I am working in uh, deep into the district cooling and uh, industry for the last 10 years. Uh, most of you know that uh, the cooling demand of a building is about, uh, which consumes about 70% of the total building energy in this part of the world. 
And uh, uh, the share of district cooling, as uh, the ambassador was mentioning, has been one of the highest in the region. Actually, Qatar ranks number two in the region in terms of district cooling, we call penetration. In 2008, the district cooling share was 1.7 percentage, now which is we are close to 10 percentage, 8 to 10 percentage. So which is a, which is a substantial uh, jump. And I attribute this to the uh, real estate development uh, happening uh, along for the FIFA uh, 2022 event and the Qatar National Vision 2030, which emphasizes or envisions uh, there is a sustainable development for the uh, citizens and the residents. So there is a lot of emphasis on energy efficient cooling uh, in this part of the world and especially in Qatar. And Qatar is uh, penetration of district cooling is quite good. Now going into, uh, as my uh, task has been made easy by the previous five speakers, but I just want to go and uh, a little more detail why district cooling is more efficient. Because it's very easy to say we are 45 to 50 percentage more efficient. And with thermal storage, we are even 60 percentage more efficient. So what in Marafek, what we do is that we do uh, from concept design stage to the specification preparation, we go into uh, very details of uh, what kind of equipments to be used, what kind of efficiency we need. And uh, we, in, we ensure that the project is managed properly so that the, when the EPC contractor finishes a project, he hands over us a plant which is uh, operating as the efficiency plant. And, uh, and we have been we are quite, quite successful in that, actually. Currently, uh, Lucille, has, uh, Lucille City has two operating plants. Uh, the one is about to finish, 48,000 ton capacity. And we are also operating in Barba, two plants of 38,000 ton total. So when Lucille City is finished, uh, uh, by 2030, the district cooling system would have saved uh, half a million tons of CO2 per year, which is a huge figure. At the total installed capacity in Lucille plant is 360,000 tons. Barwa currently, the two district cooling plants are saving 34,000 tons of uh, carbon dioxide per year. So this is a significant saving, especially if you consider uh, Qatar is one of the highest uh, per capita CO2 emission countries along with the region. Though the share of uh, overall carbon dioxide emission is only 0 0.25, we have a big uh, way to go in terms of uh, reducing this per capita uh, CO2 emissions. So district cooling in a big way is going to help us, coupled with uh, thermal energy storage, uh, reduce the power consumption uh, uh, and, and CO2 by around 60-62%. Uh, so uh, we are actively working. We are uh, looking at the Qatar National Vision 2030. And with the uh, 2022 FIFA tournament, where the stadiums are having uh, about eight plants, I, my personal belief is that the penetration will reach around 20% by 2030, which is currently standing at around 8%. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, so what I'd like to do now is, uh, is have some question and answer. And, and as I said earlier, really hopefully some interaction with the audience, but uh, if it's okay, I do have a, a first question uh, for Ambassador Polano. Um, <clears throat> we're talking about a feverish planet and talking about possible solutions. Uh, and in the end, the only way to get there is through a kind of global consensus. Otherwise, we get ourselves stuck in a prisoner dilemma where it makes sense for some people to just not do the work uh, and, and benefit from it in the short term. So it's a big challenge. Um, we saw an agreement in Paris uh, recently, which was a kind of diplomatic success. It was a diplomatic success, but obviously it's only a first step. It's only an acknowledgement that something should be done. Um, today, with things as they are, how optimistic are you about our prospects for addressing this problem adequately as a global community? Well. It's a difficult question with uh, President Trump's uh, position on, on the, uh, the climate change agreement. And uh, here in, in the Gulf region, we are also very much aware of the challenges that the uh, White House is causing to, uh, to Qatar. Uh, we, we are not focusing on this here. That, that's a more political issue, but it, it's all politics. And well, we have, due to uh, the withdrawal of, of uh, President Trump's and, and uh, the earlier commitment uh, from the U.S. administration, had to be standing even more firm together in the international community. And Sweden has increased our financing 
uh, of uh, the, um, the sustainability and all what is needed to be done. Actually, the economy of Sweden is going so well, uh, and since we are very committed to development cooperation, and our goal has always been to uh, provide 1% of our GNP to development cooperation, this means that our development cooperation uh, budget has increased by 8 billion Swedish crowns, which is uh, a bit more than 1 billion US dollar. Uh, so development cooperation towards climate change issues is one way of, uh, of uh, providing a solution. But of course we need all of us to stand uh, firm together in our commitments. And I think by speeding up using uh, district cooling, it's a very, very substantial way of, of reducing carbon emission and stop the global warming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one more from me. Uh, Vinod, you work with this stuff every day in the field. Talk to us about the practical challenges uh, of working on district cooling in, in this environment here, the climate and so on. Uh, there, are, there are a few challenges, though the technology is excellent. Um, in fact, I, before that, I would like to say that Qatar has one of the uh, first regulators in this region. Uh, Karama DC department acts as a regulator and supporter for district cooling, uh, which uh, and where their first standards also came up in last year as a draft. So uh, in spite of all that, there are challenges in district cooling um, industry. Uh, basically what I feel is that there has to be um, some kind of uh, legislation or some kind of a regulation which says that uh, above certain capacities of cooling demand for a development, new development, district cooling is mandatory. Uh, this will uh, ensure that the developers don't put air cool chillers, which is 40-50% uh, percentage less efficient. Um, that's one, one of the challenges. Uh, that is also related to the awareness of district cooling in the public domain. There has to be more uh, awareness created in the public domain regarding district cooling uh, and how it helps to reduce the global warming. Uh, there are, uh, from inside the industry, I feel there are other challenges, uh, like the capacity utilization. You see many district cooling plants are built, but the capacity is not utilized. The, the, the reason is that people are not building according to the demand. The utility providers or um, anyone who is uh, providing district cooling, they should phase the, phase the construction in such a manner that the, uh, the demand and the installed capacity is always there. Currently in the Middle East, I see 40% uh, of the capacity only is utilized. 60% of the plant capacities are not utilized. This is one of the challenges the industry faces. Second, uh, third one is the low delta T we get from the customers. Uh, low delta T, I have to explain a little more uh, detail because uh, the temperature difference coming, the supply and return temperature difference from uh, the buildings is, if it is not as per the design, there is an erosion of uh, profitability and there is a loss of efficiency in the plant. So if you are expecting certain CO2 saving, that will not happen if, it, if the delta T is not good. For that, there is a continuous interaction is required between the uh, district cooling provider and the buildings where the district cooling is supplied. The fourth uh, challenge which I am seeing is the, in Qatar specifically, now we have switched over from desalinated water to TSE water for the treated sewerage flow in the water as the cooling tower makeup in district cooling plants. So long term availability and quality has to be ensured so that the district cooling plants can operate on a sustainable way. The fifth challenge what I have uh, always been discussing is and I believe the uh, regulator uh, Karama is actively looking at is uh, the district cooling plant discharges. Uh, there has to be a mechanism by which the district cooling plants can have a smooth uh, approvals for discharge uh, when we are using TSE. And uh, the last but not the least is no, don't just sit on the current laurels, district cooling saves 40 to 50 percentage. We are happy with that, no. We have to look for uh, better solutions like uh, when a new development comes, why not look for tri-generation with some of uh, some share from uh, renewables, which has not happened in this region so far, I think. So we have to uh, just not sit on the laurels, what we have, we have to look forward. On. That's all. Vinod, what a wonderfully well-structured reply. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, questions from the audience? Come on, somebody must be curious. Uh, we have a hand up. Celia had um, mentioned uh, framework 
support from political leaders and knowledge transfer as um, being elements of encouraging district energy. And I'd like to hear what the panelists have to say, what their opinions might be on mechanisms by which we can actually transfer that knowledge. District cooling is not rocket science. <laughs> Granted, if you try hard enough, you can mess it up. But there's a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge, and we really need to have it shared with everybody else. How do you think you might do that? Who's up for it? Yeah, we can go for it, no problem. All questions we can transfer, <laughs> okay, if you like. So um, I need just to start with two elements. Before we, uh, to answer his question, I don't like to do like intermittent answers. If you allow me, just to explain a little bit about the, this region. You need to take frankly about the region, what is happening. Always, if you need to do a successful business, you have to come back to the business as usual part. So this is, will be your benchmark, your reference values. So let's now, currently, I'm talking about, now let's talk about the whole Gulf region. Currently, the GCC countries, they have over 50 billion US dollar installed cooling capacities. And the running cost, fuel, the fuel cost, I'm talking about the uh, annual fuel cost 20 to run this more than 20 billion US dollar annual. I'm talking about the GCC level. I'm talking about marketing reports. This is like the past decades. Let's talk about the future. Now this is just to see if we continue, I agree with you, if we can continue doing the business as usual up to 2030. What is going to happen? Up to 2030, two thirds, because demand, urbanization, fast growing, fast growing, this is all will, will impact you will actually come back to three times the capacity we have right now, and you can go to, we have carrier, you have train, you can, I know their business very well, and they can give you the marketing report, and you can, they can give you exactly what type of units they are targeting up to 2030 in terms of technology, because they know the market growth. And you can see if the district cooling part of it. And I can show, because I, I knew all of these reports, and I saw all the reports and the growing reports. Yes, I'm giving you the story. So if we continue, Doing what we are doing, we will end up with, say, 150, I'm talking about uh, installed capacity, a billion ton installed, uh, million tons installed uh, capacities. And actually, the running costs, I'll talk about the running costs, you need also for electricity, another infrastructure of this 100, extra 100 by 2030, around, talk about the Gulf region, about 100, uh, also uh, 120 billion US dollar in investment in infrastructure just only for cooling part. And I think you can go to the quotes done by engineer al Quari when he said the quotes, what is the impact in their contribution because he's president of Kahrama. And then you can see these numbers and you have to take this number seriously because he's a president of Kahrama and say two thirds and 50% of my demand, two thirds of my peak is also impacted by cooling. And this is like uh, official statistics we can, say, we can say. So by that, the Gulf region will have, you know how much they're going to spend? 1.5 bi uh, million barrel per day. I'm talking about this extra of oil. So 1.5 billion barrel per day of oil to compensate. I'm talking about for now up to 2030. So we have to, we have to come back to this solution. There is no way. If we offset by converting, talk about two type of approaches in terms of uh, from business as usual, we have two types. We have qualitative approach and we have quantitative approach. The quantitative approach, you come back to the energy efficiency and so on, which is already represented here. This is part of the story. We need to tell, the, uh, the, uh, to tell how we can move to, to this recording. So this is not only quantitative, uh, quantitative, quantitative in terms of energy efficiency. Yes, it's 30% figures are proven. But I'm talking about, by the way, I always have to put underline district cooling efficient under certain conditions. This is the most important, not say district cooling is efficient under certain conditions, because if it's not designed, constructed, and operated under these conditions, it will not be efficient. And the, all these investments, capital investments, will come back again as money drain. I'm telling you, this, this is exactly money drain. So what is going to happen right now, so we have to do it from, from uh, A to Z right. And this is why I'm happy now, Kaharama, they put their standards on uh, to everyone to start the kickoff. 
So with this kickoff, people they have to come back and improve this one. So they have to take this hanging fruit as a starting, and then we kick off and, and doing the other business. This is number one. So we come back to the other part. So we have uh, environmentally, we have quantitative, yes. We can convert this, uh, th this if, uh, uh, efficiency by uh, percentage. And as you know how much you are going to save per day, 200,000 by using this record, 200,000 barrel per day. This is, this is just in terms of oil. This is saving for this region. And this is equal to 20 gig, also you have around 20 gigawatt of electricity will be saved in the infrastructure investment. This is a really big number to talk about. It is not something small. So everyone knows, everyone knows. So where is the problem? <laughs> where is the problem? The problem is the planning. The problem is the planning. So I'm telling you one thing, you can do the best, but someone sit sitting in a planning authority can do something completely different and also make your life easy. Because now, district cooling, to make it right, you need density of population, right? Otherwise, it will be like uh, uh, additional piping cost, something. So you need, this, you need to create this density. For example, Lucille is, a, is, is an example. When they have the density of occupation, they have the variation in load, they move to the district cooling immediately. And this is something we have to look at it. Developers, you cannot rely on them. So you have the urban planning part. They have to put it part of the government planning to be part as a utility. Like, well, I'm selling electricity, I'm selling water, I'm selling chilled water. This is, could be a solution, but who is doing this? I have really to, to match with the urban planning side. So if the urban planning is going right, Kahrama is going left, someone is going to back, you will end up with awkward situation. There is no solution for it, and you will end up with 1.5 million barrel per day. So this is the thing. The other part of it, so you have regulatory. The other part of it, it's a big story, Developer, so I ha I'm a developer. I have mall A, mall B, mall C, mall C, even together. If you go to this road, you find six malls on the same, same road, six malls built together. So there is no coordination between developers. So why developers cannot coordinate and make their own district cooling instead of installing? This is part of the story because they are actually, this is um, scaring of this capital investment. This is type of a scare, I call it. I don't want to put in capital investment. And even if you find a developer wants to invest in the capital investment, you will find it even come back to the worst case side, say, I have to aggregate my cost to where? To the rent, to the buyer, to whoever. So you will aggregate your cost, your investment cost. You make it even more hard for people who are doing this technology. So we have really, the route is clear. The government has to take action to, be, to make it easier as a utility. And also you have the power tariff. You have to be changed because it's also not Competitive, you know, competitive, and you have to come back. So without government regulations, you have two parts. Uh, it has to be read, like set tariff, tariff for who? For service provider, for district cooling, you cannot sell with any price to the end user, to the, serv to the, the, to the developer. So you have this three should be controlled. And from this one, you can build a really uh, successful story, but you should have very good urban planning side. Sorry, uh, it's long. Any question you can convert. Remind me never get into an argument with Isa. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Who's up next? Please, not me again. This one back here. Ah, great. I'm Nisar from Rafik. We are talking about energy efficiency in district cooling. I believe also we need to talk and if we have... Uh, more elaboration from the representative of UN, UN Environment and International Agency, Energy Agency. Uh, the major role to increase the temperature of our planet is the way of energy generation or the techniques what we are using in energy generation. Uh, right now, the energy generation by coal is approximately 40% by coal and uh, 27% by gas. For the coal, the major role is by China and America. What the UN laws and uh, International Energy Agency, they are doing to convert the coal energy and other energy uh, techniques to the uh, re renewable energy. Because renewable currently is only 13%. And we are talking about from last maybe 10 years that we are converting to uh, renewable energy. But still, the share of the renewable is very less. So what's the plan or how the UN environment is working with America and China, the major producer by coal? Thank you. Sorry, I don't know if I understood well the question. So is uh, to know what United Nations is doing uh, to uh, increase the 
the percentage of renewable energy. Um, is that the question? So in, in uh, I, I don't know, I, I guess that was the question. So um, they are in sustainable energy for all four key sectors. One of them is uh, energy efficiency. And in the energy efficiency um, uh, acts, we have the Digital Energy and CDC initiative, among others. There is another act of this sustainable energy for all, uh, which is on renewable energy. I don't know exactly what are the programs that are under that. Uh, what we are doing, we have many programs working in uh, working in China, in uh, US. Uh, so United Nations works uh, mainly uh, supporting uh, developing countries and emerging economies. So um, actually, we do not have a program in uh, United States to help uh, develop renewable energy, as we don't have it in Europe because we understand that they have uh, the, um, I don't know, the potential enough and the understanding and the knowledge to develop it by themselves. But we do have that in, uh, uh, in China. And uh, just because I'm working in the District Energy and Cities Initiative, um, just to mention that one of the reasons why we're working on this is because we, are, we see District Energy as an enable uh, enabling technology to increase also uh, the, um, the percentage of use of renewable energy. Uh, we are working, for example, in, um, in Chile right now on district heating, and we are uh, doing some kind of campaign awareness raising to try to combine uh, solar heating uh, and uh, biomass to feed their district heating networks, for example. So from our side, from our program, we try always to combine that. One of the reasons, because you're, you're mentioning China, uh, actually China uh, has uh, quite a good number of uh, district heating and cooling networks already. So why are we working in China? They asked for our support, actually, to make their um, networks more renewable. They uh, have their networks running with coal, and they want to change that, and they want to make their networks more renewable. So we are um, starting, because we are starting our program there, uh, helping to make these uh, networks more renewable. Or, for example, we're working in Serbia, Eastern Europe, in Belgrade, Belgrade has, I don't know if the biggest, but one of the biggest district heating networks in Europe. Um, it was not very efficient, so one of the reasons why they approached us was to help them make their network more efficient. And also, one of their objectives is to uh, include solar heating as one of the main source of energy for the district heating network. So, um, from our perspe perspective and from our program, we are helping in a way uh, certain, uh, certain markets to integrate solar energy, biomass, renewables into uh, the district heating network. So it's not just uh, opening the mar but a market for district energy, but also trying to make it more renewable, more efficient, greener. It's one of the, one of the things we're working on. Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> Thank you, Senator John. Yeah, just to quickly respond to this, um, the, the IEA, um, of course, has multiple um, initiatives and bilateral partnerships that are working with developing countries, the same as UN Environment, um, uh, one of which is our District Heating and Cooling Collaborative, um, and Robin Wiltshire, who is the chair of this, will be here this afternoon. Um, but I wanted to come back to this point about renewables and particularly talking about a sustainable and efficient world moving forward. Um, in this equation, very often we think about putting renewables into the system because it makes it cleaner, it makes it more sustainable. Um, but we like to say at the IEA that we should see energy efficiency first, um, and this is why we call energy efficiency the first fuel. Just to give you an example, coming back to the question of cooling, the average global efficiency of standalone cooling equipment, so room air conditioners, last year was a COP of two. Okay, so 200% efficiency. We know that best available equipment in most markets is a COP of at least four, so twice what people are actually buying. When we're talking about district cooling networks, we know that we have annual operations above COPs of four, and we have seen in best practices COPs as high as 20 in some of the most efficient cooling networks. So if we're thinking about this, we have huge opportunity to offset the need for renewables if we pursue efficiency first. And just to give you an example of the magnitude of efficiency's potential, 
if by 2020 we were to put in place mandatory efficiency standards of LED lighting, a COP of four or greater for cooling equipment, and the equivalent of Energy Star or A plus um, appliances for residential buildings, we would save between 2020 and 2030 more than 1,700 terawatt hours of electricity. That is the equivalent of half of the world's current nuclear capacity. Okay? So when thinking about what are we pursuing for the future, renewables is a critical piece in cleaning up the energy mix. But energy efficiency has to play a critical role in moving forward to make sure that those renewables can be used effectively. Thanks, John. Um, I have a question which might require some local expertise, and including Per, maybe. I, I, I'm wondering about something. Uh, I would imagine that electricity prices in Qatar are at the moment quite low. And we have a, a challenge in Europe when it comes to district heating. Basically, if, if you look at the simple cost, it's cheaper to burn oil or gas for your heat than it is to get involved with developing district heating network. If you forget all the external costs, like the environmental impact and the cost of your security of supply problems, the cheap thing to do is to burn some gas. And I consider the gas boiler to be nothing more than a giant market failure. And I could imagine that here you have a problem if you have very cheap electricity, it limits the incentive to develop what is probably ultimately at macro level a better solution in the form of, of, of district cooling networks. Is that a challenge here? And if so, what can be done about it? Yeah, uh, Paul, I, uh, I think you're absolutely right that um, we see it in, in different parts that if uh, electricity is too much subsidized, it, it is a hurdle for, for, for the development of district uh, cooling. Uh, and um, so, so that is w what's what I mean also with the long-term stable policy framework that they create a level playing field uh, between the standalone solutions and, and district uh, uh, cooling. Uh, so I think there is also government work to be done so that there is uh, uh, transparency here in, in, in real costs. Uh, that, uh, uh, so, but we also see that even with a high, high level of, of um, uh, subsidies, uh, I can take another country in another part, like Trinidad, which is similar to Qatar here with big oil resources. We are able to create uh, profitable district cooling, even if there is heavy subsidies. Uh, they have a price of electricity that is maybe a tenth of other countries in the Caribbean. So uh, in, in, in the basics, district cooling and with the eff energy efficiency, as, as, uh, as John mentioned, that at least twice as good uh, makes uh, these investments. And at the same time that you only have to uh, invest half of the capacity <coughs> compared to, to the standalones, means that the other half you can uh, invest in, in, in the grid. So you, you earn money on district cooling on energy efficiency. But of course, if the electricity price is too low, there is a hurdle. And I think that is, is the, to give the right price is, is extremely important. And I think there might still be something to do here also in, in, in the region on, on that side. Isam yeah. looks excited. Okay, if you wanted to comment on that. Actually, it has two parts. One part of it is politics, which is, could be uh, explained, but might not be the right uh, place. But anyway, this is part of it is politics, but the, part, the biggest part of it, let's understand how the business here is going. This is also the most important. Where is the investment? If we talk about electricity tariff, whom you are targeting, we have two different parts here. The whole government investment is on the, uh, sorry, the whole, the biggest investment in Qatar is government investment. So for example, who built the infrastructure for Lucerne? This is government investment, but when they come back to the government, they build it as district cooling. So that means still you have connection between the government and between the private sector. So if you are talking about the old boundaries for Doha or whatever, so now you have, we are talking about two different things. Now we can come back to the scenario we're talking about the energy efficiency, the operation, to change the units, but we cannot talk about right now to retrofit, 
re-innovate the whole uh, city for this recording. But there are other approaches which is done by Kahrama to do it. But for example, when I come back to the new projects, but who is doing that? Is it a single Qatari guy sitting to build a villa, his, his whole his dreams to build a house, or the 130 billion US dollars invested by the government? Who we should target? I'm not targeting the, five, the guy who is taking loan to buy his villa, or the guy who wants or the government which is spending 100 or 100 for, for venues, for infrastructure, for new cities. This will be my target. This target, I have to do it right. So that means I believe in this stage, there is an informal agreement between citizens and government. So this is something, there is no, this is, we have to keep it. The electricity and water business is completely different, different model. You have uh, Uridu, you have Vodafone, but you have only one Kahrama for that reason. So that means we need to appreciate this part. But for whole government investment, we can ask, why this government investment not the right? This is, we have a question. But I'm not going to follow a single Qatari guy who's going to build a villa for that one. I think this is my uh, interpretation. And I think most of the new master plans are incorporating this recording anyway. Okay. Sorry, you know, maybe if you have a different point of view. Now, we have eight minutes. Uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, check if there's any last question from the audience. Uh, I think there's a hand up, two hands up. There. Right. Oh. Ibrahim al Saida from Kahrama. Uh, with regards to the planning part, planning if you start from top, bottom, top Correct. government planning for the whole country, we have already coordinated with them and we have assigned some areas for district cooling. Perfect. Okay. Going down, uh, developers. Developers and uh, designers need to do their homework right for district cooling. Designers not to over design for district cooling, and then it reflects badly on the tariff. Plus, on the lifetime of the network itself. So you need also the project to be uh, executed phase-wise, yes. not to construct the full project and the uh, utilization of the district cooling itself, you will fully use it after 20 years. And you, you will have to reflect also the tariff on the first tenant. That should be considered also. Thank you. Agree. Other questions out there? Yeah. I'm Lukman from uh, QF. My question uh, bothers on the financial aspect. We're quite aware that uh, district cooling uh, setup is uh, really finance intensive. And uh, if UN agrees that uh, yeah, the district cooling also contribute an immense part into energy efficiency and reducing carbon prints, what plans or incentive the UN has for these industries to be able to grow in developing countries? Mm -hmm. um, so we actually, with the District Energy Cities Initiative, what we are trying to do um, is help the countries devel develop this framework to try to alleviate kind of the risks that the private sector uh, needs to take, and we are aware of that, uh, when they want to build this kind of infrastructure. So when we are starting a market from scratch, and I can, uh, it's very hard, um, and I can mention, for example, the, the, what we are working now in Chile. So um, there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding and awareness raising that we need to do first. And, um, well, what we try to do, for example, one of the things is try to um, first understand what are the lessons learned that we can get from the uh, best uh, practices around the world. For, ex for example, try to work with the local government and also at the national level um, on what kind of business model uh, would be um, uh, most, uh, I know, 
would be better, uh, would have more advantages for that, uh, for that particular market. In uh, the case of Chile, which is, for example, a, a free market, what we're trying to do is help them understand that we uh, cannot start a market uh, from scratch without having the local government involved. We try to convince them that starting a project with, uh, mm, for example, big public buildings would be a good thing to do, that we need a certain amount of density, that we need uh, a load, and uh, also we need to make the uh, local governments understand that there is a quite a high risk that the private sector needs to take, and you need to reassure them them uh, that they need to get uh, their uh, return back. So we kind of uh, make them understand that you need, for example, a long concession um, a contract of 20, 30 years that they cannot just sign the contract in two or three years because no investor would go there and invest. So we try to make them understand that there are risks that the, that the technical, that the private sector needs to take and we, and we try to work with them to alleviate that. Um, so I don't know if your question was if we, um, uh, from UN, we actually mm, kind of finance the construction, probably that's what you're asking. Not from our program, because we don't have the budget to do that, uh, we don't have that, but uh, with the Paris Agreement, we also have the, um, uh, the GCF, the Global Climate Fund. And uh, so with the GCF, we would have more funding um, to maybe kickstart or start kickstarting uh, certain projects. But we don't fund now construction. We just work on the framework. And the reason is because we don't have uh, enough budget uh, now for that. Um, so, uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Now, we are down to two minutes, and I am determined to finish this session on time, even if I really could go on because of the, the quality of the people we have up here. But in these two minutes, um, is there anything that any of you would really like to, to get off your chest before we wind down? Yeah. Uh, we talked about uh, dif uh, district cooling making more uh, <coughs> profitable and uh, more viable. There are uh, models on uh, dual tariff, power tariff uh, in many parts of the world, or varying tariff. So if a district cooling plant has a thermal energy storage, if you have a nighttime lower tariff, we could operate at a much economical rate and discharge the cooling in the daytime. So this is one of the thoughts, uh, but uh, has been uh, discussed at various levels, but not much progress has been made on this. Thank you. Ambassador. Yeah, very quickly about education, the role of uh, massive education on climate change and uh, the spirit of innovation in the spirit of engineering. Uh, we would uh, uh, see, we would like to see more cooperation between countries on exchange of university education, masters in, in district cooling. Uh, the spirit of engineering from Sweden has been very uh, much behind our success story with the innovations uh, during the last century. And I think all this to teach our school children up to the highest university education is key uh, to, to be successful with uh, global warming and, uh, and be tr successful together. Th perhaps UN could do a little bit more also to support all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Just, just to add that one of the things, uh, one of the barriers or challenges that we have most in those developing countries is the lack of awareness uh, of the problem. So one of the, of the key aspects uh, on which we work is awareness raising, and that's one of the thing and key things for the success. I agree with that. Yeah. It's good uh, to work together on this part because in the last uh, five, six or seven years we trained more than 4,500 which is also good uh, effort, I think, done locally and also internationally. They travel to Qatar to get the training and they get also the membership here. And I think also the training started with the Ministry of Public Works in Qatar here, where we, uh, as you know, uh, they are applying sustainability in their buildings. And now also we uh, send to, uh, to, uh, to the schools, uh, also to teach students and so on. So this type of programs, it's really is going to be helpful and international collaboration also will help Everyone we are working on the same target anyway. So, but also building capacity is something. Capacity building is a big issue here. Thank you, Isam. You said something important just now. It's good to work together. Mm -hmm. We have serious problems. Uh, we need serious people and serious solutions. We've had six very serious people up here this morning. Um, please join me in giving them a round of applause.
And, uh, and with that, I can, ah, we have a last question. Uh, we have two questions. Okay. Yes, uh, this is Salah Nizam. I think uh, we have today an opportunity to leverage the know-how because maybe in Qatar we have the choice to pick between the standalone system and the district cooling. But in a number of cities in Europe now, they have to go for district cooling. A few years back, I was in Budapest uh, to give an advice. A number of buildings, uh, like landmark building they could not have an outdoor cooling because the city is forbidden to put any outdoor units on the balconies and they have no roof. So uh, people are starving to have a kind of cooling. They have to go for portable. And the only and the unique, the only solution for them is to go for district cooling for 100 years building. Now that's a challenge. I think this event should have clear recommendation at the end to share the know-how to leverage the experience here of number of 22P and share with other cities in the world that are waiting for a kind of direction in going for district cooling. And thank you. May I? May I also say that I would like to give a compliment to President Isal Kovari for uh, when it comes to education for the Karama Awareness Center. It's highly educative and uh, the way you have developed uh, uh, the possibilities for the Qatari visitors, school children, up to university degrees to learn about uh, climate change and uh, also your very impressive Tarashid program, how to be more energy efficient in water and electricity. Uh, I would like to congratulate you to, to what you are doing and we are very glad to be partners with you continuously. Thank you. So, if there are no more urgent questions, uh, I think we can consider the session closed. Thank you all very much for being here, and uh, see you again shortly. Thank you. Thank you.